Welcome to our review on sampling techniques. So the first thing we actually need to think about are the problems that we're going to encounter when we're trying to do any form of environmental sampling. And the two key problems we've got are that there are many different organisms, which we obviously be, need to be able to identify, and secondly, that they live all over the place. When we're considering sampling, there are four key terms we need to understand the meanings for. So the first one is the distribution. So whenever we're talking about the distribution, what we're talking about is where the species is actually found over the total area in which they occur. If we're talking about the population of an organism, quite simply we're just talking about the number of that particular organism in a given area. If we're referring to the relationships, then that's the interactions between the species living in the same area. And finally, the term sampling just refers to counting a small number of a large total population to then be able to study it without counting every single individual present. If we consider why we actually carry out sampling, then there are several key ideas behind that. So the first thing that we'll be able to do from taking these samples is we can record where the organisms are found. It will also allow us to collect fair and accurate data that's also reliable. We can collect the organisms themselves so that we can then identify them at a later stage and it gives us the number of organisms present in each species as well. Next thing we need to understand are the different sampling techniques we can use to actually get this information. So the first one, one you've probably used in school, is the quadrat. So what we have there is a square frame that's got a set area. So the typical one we use in school is a half metre square. So what we actually do with that is by using a random number generator, we generate positions that we will then place the quadrat on the ground and then count the organisms within it. So this then gives us a total count within a given area and we can then multiply that up to the total area of the field to then ascertain how many of each plant are present in the entire area without counting every single organism. Second technique we can look at then is something called a transect line. So what we do here is we're going to lay a tape across an environment and the best example of this one is looking organisms along a beach. So you lay a tape from close to the sea all the way up the beach and then we're going to count the organisms that actually touch the tape. Another way we could use this is again having that tape running up the beach but place quadrats as you can see in the picture there at regular intervals so every two meters say and then count all of the organisms present within those quadrats. And by doing this, we can then work out the distribution of organisms up that seashore. Our third technique are nets. So if we want to be able to catch animals, things like fish or butterflies, for example, then what we'll do is use a sweep net, like the one you can see in the picture at the bottom there, and then just pass it through that environment, collecting the organisms, and then we can count them. Generally, we, we will use a net if these organisms are quite hard to count because they're liable to move from the area in a short space of time. So by using the net, we can catch them, count them easily, and then obviously release them back into their environment unharmed. The next technique is a pooter. So if we want to actually count the number of small organisms, things like ants, for example, then again, they're liable to move around to make it very difficult to count them if we try and count them in situ. So a pooter then is that little container you can see in the bottom left corner that's got two straws, one of which very importantly has a little mesh covering over it. And what we will do is you'll suck through the one with the mesh covering on it, placing the other straw where the insect is. That will then be sucked into the container and then we can obviously count them and identify them easily. The last technique we can use is something called a pitfall trap. So what we actually do here is we're going to bury a container like a jam jar, for example, in the ground, making sure that the top of it is level with the surface. Then we'll put a little roof over it so that it doesn't fill with rainwater. And then as we get things like beetles that wander along the ground, they will then fall into our little pitfall trap. We can then obviously go back at a later stage, take the little jar out of the ground and count and identify which are present and then obviously release them back safely. Once we've actually got data, we need to carry out some calculations. Now, one of the most important calculations that we use is through this capture recapture technique. So if, for example, we wanted to identify the number of grasshoppers living in a particular field, we'd go out with our net and we'd collect some samples. 
We then count how many grasshoppers there were, and when we've got them, we'd actually mark them somehow, and then we'd release them back into their same environment. We'd go back at a later stage, maybe a day or two later, and then repeat that exact same method for capturing them, and then we'd count them up again. But this time, we'd be counting two important things. One, the total number of grasshoppers we've caught, and secondly, how many of them had been previously marked by us. Once we've got that information, we use the calculation you can see at the bottom there. So the number in our first sample times the number in the second sample, and we divide that by the number that were previously marked that we recaptured in the second sample. That will then give us this estimation of the total population size in that area. When using the capture recapture technique, we do make a couple of assumptions that we need to bear in mind. Between those samples, we are assuming that no one has died, that there has been no immigration and no emigration. So just bear in mind those three assumptions that we are making. There's no death, no immigration, no immigration. Now, what we also need to make sure of to get as accurate a picture as possible about that population size is that we're going to use the exact same sampling method both times that we go out and do our actual capture technique and that when we're marking those individuals, it's not going to affect their survival. So for example, if you'd use like a spot of nail varnish on the back of a grasshopper to mark it, then making sure that you're not going to stick their legs to their back, for example, would obviously make them better at surviving. If you manage to stick their legs to their back, clearly that's going to affect their ability to survive. So just bear in mind that we've got to make sure the sampling method used is the same both times and that we're not going to affect their survival by marking them. Last thing we need to consider is how to make our samples as accurate as possible. And there are three key things to bear in mind. First one is we've got to have a large sample size. So if we only take a very small number of samples, that means that if there's one with an error, then that gets magnified when we multiply it up to the total size. Second one is we've got to repeat the recordings. So the more quadrats we record, for example, the more reliable our data will be. And finally, we need to be fair. So using a random number generator to decide where we place the quadrats eliminates that bit of bias that we could have. I mean, it's very easy when you're going out to count daisies in a field that when you've put down 20 quadrats and not counted a single daisy and you can see one over there to just think, oh, look, I'm going to put the quadrat over there. But bear in mind, if you're doing that, it's not going to be unbiased and therefore you're going to have inaccurate data.